everything that we practice, it compiles on itself and it compounds. And so what you learn from doing F major one week, even if it's not perfect, that's gonna continue when you go to the next scale. What's going on? It's Jason Heath and Lauren Pierce, one of my favorite people in the double bass world, put out this awesome book called Scales, Scales, Scales. That's what it is. It's available in our sheet music store and we dig into this topic with Lauren and much more. All right, scale, scale, scales. That's definitely what we've got here. And I love everything that Lauren puts out. There's a lot of thought put into how it's framed. And this introduction, I think, is absolutely great. She just describes her background, uh, getting into the base. And then you think, uh, I t telling a story with scales, how's that going to happen? But it does, and she does a great job with this. This was an unexpected passion project. I never imagined I would write a book about scales. I'm so familiar with my own approach to scales because like I say in the book, I've been doing the slow scale as I lay out in the book since freshman year of college. Thinking about how to incorporate scales into your warm up is is critical. I mean, I do it every day. I was just doing it before I filmed this video and she's really taken an intentional, thoughtful approach to this. Progress, she says, I find this to be so true, is annoyingly non-linear and that, uh, you know, bad habits can creep in, but these slow scales are a great way to just sort of check how things are going and check in with uh, solutions that you may find for those problems and, and just trying to be distant, objective, she says emotionless about the difficulty of each key. I think that the way it's laid out in the book was the way I had it in mind was taking it from someone who is a beginner or at least fairly new to the instrument, uh, whether that's like day zero or, you know, year one, how, however you define that for yourself, you're going to know. And it sort of being a companion to your journey through the instrument. And you don't have to start at one octave scales. You can start wherever you feel comfortable. The point is not necessarily the scales themselves in the book as I've written them. It's the learning of how to make them a vehicle, mm -hmm. you know, for exploration, for improving your technique, all of that. So for someone who is a beginner, I think it's laid out pretty well to just start on page one and start with F major, that one's first, and then we go through the cycle of fifth. So Lauren has the metronome on 60, so I will put 60 on the metronome. So we'll start off with one octave, major and minor scale. So here's uh, F major, we're gonna start with. Thinking about bow speed. And I'm really trying to make sure that I use every millimeter of bow. I'm thinking about dividing the bow 25, 50, 75, 100%. I find that the more critical I can be about all the little details, especially with the quote unquote simple stuff, which is usually not that simple, the more I'll be set up to do all the other work that's coming with the rest of the day. changes as I go from strength to strength. Now I'm going to half notes. This pattern Lauren lays out here makes these all connect very elegantly so you don't have to stop in the middle of the exercise, which is great for endurance.
like a technical exercise is sort of built to be somewhat straightforward of like, okay, well you approach it this way, but scales are so vast and open-ended. So that was a goal for the book to give, you know, a very clear method of how you could practice scales. You don't have to, but this is something where you can use it as a jumping off point. Then she gets into minor scales and there are a few different areas of focus, just the nature of minor scales. She talks about shifting and because of this half step at the beginning, that's just a little bit more of a thing to think about. And then thinking about speed, weight, and placement, the triangle of sound production as Lauren talks about it, a uh, great concept. And I just love how this is sprinkled throughout, just, just some wisdom, things to think about as you progress. We'll do C minor this time and we'll put a C drone on. Get the metronome going. And we'll try the fingering. Here we go. And immediately I hear that my ears are adjusting slightly differently. Really thinking about tuning these. It's reminding me of the video I did with Molly Sharp on just intonation a few years back. always wondered with minor scales like what do you want to practice do you want to practice melodic minor and natural minor and harmonic minor or what and then they're all different fingering so I just like that she just does natural major scales minor scales and and it just keeps things nice and neat and tidy your fingerings do just naturally become a little bit more complex when you get into the world of minors um, but that's okay and I am guilty as a teacher of neglecting minors for far too long so I love that it's up here front and center in this book just right after for the major one octaves. I always felt like I, I was privileged with the way that I was taught to practice scales because it was really from like day one, my teacher assigned me and all of my um, fellow students um, the slow scale. And it was sort of like, you do one key per week and we go on the cycle of fifths, et cetera, et cetera. And that was just what I continued. I mean, I, I still have so many of the tenets of, you know, practicing and approaching the instrument that I learned from day one at college that I still use. And that's one of them. So I feel really lucky because a lot of students that I talk to, a lot of students that I have come to teach don't know that, you know, they don't have a plan because it's not straightforward. Now we're getting into two octave scales and she's giving us more areas of focus. So we've got closing open strings. She's written these out so that all the open strings are now closed. So that the one octave minors were kind of training wheels using the open strings. Now you're going to be closing them. Uh, the vibrato, she says, because there are no open notes played, this is an opportunity to focus on vibrato, especially for, especially for the slow rhythms. So for me, it's like quarter note and slower, I think is a great opportunity to vibrate. If you're newer, maybe, half note uh, or whole notes. And then she talks about the sweet spot. So as we move higher up the fingerboard, continuing to focus on bow placement, as well as how the sweet spot changes when moving up and down, how that feels. Andy Moritz and I had a wonderful conversation about that and his book, Scale Skills, which I will link up to here. And it's just something that is great to think about and that I am uh, frequently forgetting to think about on professional gigs and my own practicing. So it's great to have that as a reminder here. I will try that G major. I won't do the drone right now just so I can focus on vibrating on these notes, but you can certainly drone while you practice vibrato. That's totally cool. Here we go. So whole notes. And then back. 
back down and with all the same rhythms and uh, how they all just elegantly flow into each other from the whole note to the half note to the quarter to the eighth to the triple to the sixteenth just makes for one long exercise uh, longer than the one octave certainly now because we've got the two octaves but it's all good stuff and just taking a key week and going through these uh, great approach I really push my students new seasoned young and old to do one key per week because my students there are two flavors. They're either super impatient and they want to do one key like every hour, you know, they want to do all the keys all at once, which is, I love that. Or they are perfectionists <laughs> and they want to stick with this one scale until they can get it absolutely perfect. And that's just not the point of it. Right. So I think whether you're a beginner or you have more experience on the instrument, being able to stick to a routine is really what I was going for with this book. And also pushing yourself to just do what's on the page, stick with the metronome, do the best that you can, put your fingers in the right place as you're able. And even if it feels like, you know, especially the triplets in the 16th, even if that's just like a little bit too fast, you feel like you're not able to keep up, just, just you know, keep going, don't stop. That's something that I have to struggle with, or I don't have to, but I do struggle <laughs> every single week when I start a new key, even after all this time, I still struggle with the faster rhythms, but I just know now that I have to just keep going and I can only focus on putting my fingers in roughly the right spot, whether they're in tune or not will come later, but staying with the metronome, putting my fingers in the right place and then just pushing on. And I just say that because I think if you can get in that mindset sooner, whether you're new to the instrument or not, but especially if you're new to the instrument, then you're going to have a lot more success and be able to actually enjoy playing, whether as opposed to getting into that perfectionist mindset that we all get into from time to time. And then three octaves. So areas of focus, endurance, yes. There is a vast difference between practicing two octave scales and three octave scales. She says adding more octaves demands more energy and focus. Uh, push through your mistakes and through the faster rhythms, especially in the first few days to build up endurance. That's something that can be hard for people to do, but Francois Rabat talks about that in his materials and many educators do. And I do think it's important to develop that endurance and to learn how to just get through like little snafus and blips and bloops. Cause if you don't, you're really just gonna never be able to get there. All right, I'll try her fingering out in C major. So we'll keep this on 60 right now. Here's C major, three octave. vibrating right now, but I could, absolutely. Or I like to practice with straight tone and really focus on the ring tones of the bass, really hearing the maximum resonance of the bass. I'm realizing <laughs> how desperately I need to practice quarter equals 60 slow scales. I'm just seeing all kinds of flaws as I get up here. And if you can get a good sound doing that, which that I would give myself a B minus maybe for that, uh, maybe maybe C, uh, maybe worse. <laughs> uh, it's gonna really help. If you can get a good sound up there, oh. Getting back to these uh, money notes is just gravy. Being able to play a lot of different things. You know, it's it's not playing the Bodicini perfectly. It's being able to pick up pieces of music and adapt and be expressive regardless of what you're playing. We use these things to 
advance our technique. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm certainly guilty of getting into that perfectionist mindset. And I think it comes in surprising ways. You know, avoidance of practicing is a perfectionist trait. Um, sticking with G major for seven months is a perfectionist trait. Um, and also stopping in the middle of practicing or stopping in the middle of playing through something and trying to redo it and stopping and redoing and stopping and not letting yourself make mistakes. That's also a perfectionist trait. We're taught that we need to fix mistakes in practicing, but if we're constantly stopping when we're going through something, then we're teaching ourselves that every time a mistake happens, we have to stop. And then four octave scales. Are you kidding me? You're not kidding me. She goes into four octave scales. You might think that's bananas on the bass, but especially if you're playing uh, solo repertoire, just getting comfortable up in the upper register, four octaves are great. I need that in my scales practice in the morning, not just to get my head centered and in the right place for playing up in the stratosphere, but also it's valuable practice time. That's practice time for my rep as much as it is just for, you know, bass in general. So that's the slow scales. And now she gets into agility. And I just think this is a really cool concept. I didn't have the second section that you're talking about, about agility that was not in the original concept of the book. So I was really happy I was able to uh, slow down a little bit and have that added because I think it really complements the book really well. She goes into some thumb position exercises that are pretty cool. This thumb pattern of, of, that starts on the A string here. <laughs> first finger pattern. I remember learning these from Jeff Bradisage, who I did some uh, master classes with when I was back in high school. Really, this really helped me understand thumb position. And then extended thumb position, or you might think of that as low thumb position, like an A major scale and mapping it out here. So we're starting with the A here. Then, so it's those three positions or three of thumb, first, second finger orientations, just like we were practicing. Everything that we practice, it compiles on itself and it compounds. And so what you learn from doing F major one week, even if it's not perfect, that's going to continue when you go to the next scale, even if, you know, it's completely different fingering, completely different part of the instrument. So it's sort of like an ongoing exercise. And two octave thumb position scales. I mean, this just keeps going with the skill development. Super cool. So taking A major again right here, we're going to start on the D string. So we're combining this extended thumb position, this low thumb position and going up. So this one. <laughs> So for these velocity, agility exercises, this portion of the book, Lauren is doing three note groupings just because we're thinking of this as like technical playing more than lyrical playing. It's two notes becomes a little less practical as you start to speed up. Sometimes myself included, we sort of bristle and pull away from things that were like, oh, it's too hard. It's too much pain, it's too much whatever. But in the same way as working out, the, the pain is where the growth happens, you know? Um, there are different kinds of pain. Obviously, there's nuance to it. So it is what it sounds like. G major up the string scales. And these bowing variations that Lauren has in here are, are really cool. Then two octave up the string scale. So starting on G, you're going to... I like that turnaround. That's a great way to get through that. And you knew it was coming minor, so we got the same thing G minor. with you I don't really enjoy every day doing four octave scales like 
there are some days where I'm like, oh my God, okay. I have to play like right, you know, my finger gets sticky. It's so hard, you know? But um, I do feel like it's really important. And especially the concert that you were talking about, I was playing Zaguner Ryzen, uh, as well as the Bodicini. The Bodicini doesn't really go up into that register, but Zaguner Ryzen certainly does. And I need that in my scales practice in the morning, not just to get my head centered and in the right place for playing up in the stratosphere, but also it's valuable practice time. That's practice time for my rep as much as it is just for, you know, bass in general. <laughs> 